Hey, my friends, we will be right back to the show, but I have a question for you. Are you struggling with the impact of childhood trauma? Well, know that you're not alone. I'm here to let you know that I'm starting a brand new weekly coaching group that includes a year of live coaching, accountability, support, habit and goal setting, and more. I'm starting a wait list for the group right now, and I'm only taking a handful of people. And I'll let you know that through this personalized coaching, we'll work together to help you understand how your childhood trauma has shaped your beliefs, behaviors, emotions, and will help you create a roadmap for healing and growth. Right now, you can schedule an absolutely free coaching session with me and get put on the wait list if you go to thinkunbroken.com. My friends, it's your time to turn your trauma into triumph, breakdowns into breakthroughs, and become the hero of your own story. And I'm here to support you in doing that. Just go to thinkunbroken.com to register for a free coaching call with me and to get put on the wait list for the brand new weekly coaching program. Hey, my friends, we will be right back to the show. But I have a question for you. Are you struggling with the impact of childhood trauma? Well, know that you're not alone. I'm here to let you know that I'm starting a brand new weekly coaching group that includes a year of live coaching, accountability, support, habit and goal setting, and more. I'm starting a wait list for the group right now, and I'm only taking a handful of people. And I'll let you know that through this personalized coaching, we'll work together to help you understand how your childhood trauma has shaped your beliefs, behaviors, emotions, and will help you create a roadmap for healing and growth. Right now, you can schedule an absolutely free coaching session with me and get put on the wait list if you go to thinkunbroken.com. My friends, it's your time to turn your trauma into triumph, breakdowns into breakthroughs, and become the hero of your own story. And I'm here to support you in doing that. Just go to thinkunbroken.com to register for a free coaching call with me and to get put on the wait list for the brand new weekly coaching program. You're listening to the Think Unbroken podcast, and I'm your host, Michael Unbroken. I'm an author, speaker, coach, and advocate for adult survivors of childhood trauma and abuse. In this podcast, you will learn how to transform your trauma into triumph, turn breakdowns into breakthroughs, and go from victim to being the hero of your own story. You can learn more at thinkunbrokenpodcast.com, and of course, check us out on Apple Podcasts and Spotify at Think Unbroken Podcast. I am brought back to reality by this disgusting man's voice. This is your last chance, kid. This dirty old f is getting frustrated that I am stalling and letting him buy my body. And so, I make my decision. Tomorrow, I need to end this, but right now, I'm sick. I need heroin, and I will sell myself. I go completely blank. Cold. That is an excerpt from Dream Seller by Brandon Novak, who's a guest on today's podcast. Welcome, my friend. <laughs> That's not a intro. I don't know what it is. That was great. I like it. I love coming out of the gate strong. When I read that, I was just like, F you know, you think about what we have to suffer through as human beings to find the thing that brings us salvation, right? The thing that we think brings us joy or love, mm. compassion, hope, whatever it is. Sometimes it's a needle. Sometimes it's sex. Sometimes it's money. But we will do anything that it takes to get that. One of the things that I really wanted to ask you, like as I was researching you and leading up into this moment, is why do you think that you're still alive? Um. For me, it's what I know to be true is it's nothing less than uh, God's grace and mercy. Um, because that, as is anyone in recovery who's been blessed with this gift, unfortunately, it doesn't play out that way usually, right? And if you, if you follow the, the statistics, the analytics, the, uh, you know, the the data that's collected from all these studies, it states that I, a guy who's sober and I've been blessed with this new way of life, it states, statistics state 
theoretical evidence dictates that I am to be high or dead. And the fact that I'm not is A, miraculous, equaling a miracle, and B, it defies logic. So I firmly, firmly, in my whole heartedly of hearts, believe that I, I, I went through what I went through to, to be the man that I am today to help those who are where I once was, which is why I have this really sick place in my heart for drugs and alcohol. Can't get enough of it. Right? Uh, today, I just go about it in a really different manner. And, and as a direct result of the blessing I've re uh, received, my, my, my poison has become my medicine. Right? And I've, I, I, I've been put in this position, I believe, to, to God willing inspire those that may come behind me just as the gentleman by the name of Chris Herring did for me when I was coming through the doors. And I saw his video and said to myself, if he can do it, maybe I can too. It's fascinating to sit across from you for a multitude of reasons, but predominantly because same. Statistically, dude, I shouldn't be here. Should be dead or in jail. My three best friends are dead, murdered over drugs. One stabbed to death, one got shot in the head. The other one, I just don't even have the balls to talk about, to be honest with you. Sure. Drug addict parents, alcoholic family, the whole nine didn't graduate high school. And I turned that mess into a message, mm -hmm. you know, guiding millions of people every year, not only through this show, but through taking this pain, man, this thing that consumed me, you know, what, it, what would it take in my, my fix? You know, I'm the addiction side of the healing journey is fascinating. Because you're like in this place, at least for me, where I was like, oh no, this is life. It feels good to hook up with 30 different women a week. And it feels good to make millions of dollars. And it feels good to do all these things. And yet on the inside, you're like totally empty. And your journey is, is fascinating in part and parcel one because of your ability to be so resilient. And I wonder where that resilience comes from. Most people don't get to have this conversation. I include myself in that. And yet here we are. And I mean, of course I can leverage miracles in God, spirit, universe, whatever it may be. But I also think there's something a little deeper. Do you feel like you've been destined for greatness? I believe that I was uh, called on or picked for this position that I find myself in today. But I also believe that it could change in the blink of an eye. Um, but nonetheless, here we are. And I believe what better person for the job than myself. I, I'm an amazing man when it comes to playing devil's advocate. And, mm -hmm. and I'm insanely understanding of, of accepting people where they're at. Truth be told, I, I, I got sober only because the drug stopped working. What and, do you mean? and you know, you hear that often, the, the, the alcohol stopped working. And I, it legit stopped working for me by way of, you know, I, I ingest a speed ball, I sniff a line, I hit the pipe, swallow a pill, and, and this delusional effect is created without fail that has shown up for me for the better part of 21 years that allows me to escape this terrible, horrific reality that I've created, again, as a direct result of my addiction. And without foul, in just the drink of the drug, the delusional effects produced, which allows me to escape that harsh reality for a period of time, just long enough to like not only make homelessness manageable, I'll make it desirable, right? Like it, it disconnects me from this reality. It takes me into this really abnormal place, but because I go there so much, it's normal. And that's great. It shows up for me. It does exactly what it's supposed to do. But for me, in my case, at 38 years old, having attempted sobriety on so many occasions, in so many different ways, I did the worst thing I could have ever done for my 
career of drinking and drugging is I acquired some knowledge and ignorance was no longer bliss. And I started to become accountable for my actions and see the part that I played in these outcomes. And and that moment of clarity that's talked about in those brief periods of sobriety that usually create change because the outcome's no longer acceptable, depending upon the individual. For me at the end, I'm not even lying. I couldn't put another drop of water on the syringe or the plunger would pull out. Like that's how much I'd load it. And I'd blast off with a serious speedball. And that effect was no longer being produced. I was no longer able to escape this reality, meaning that moment of clarity that I was enduring was taking place when I was sober and high. It stopped working. It no longer did what it had always done for so long. And at this point, I had come so far. I'm the 38-year-old homeless heroin addict that does what the excerpt from that book read. I stand on the corner and wait for men to essentially buy me for an hour, for 10 minutes. You know, I'm living on this animalistic level and all is fair in love and war, right? None of it's personal. It's just business. I, I'm, I'm immune to, to this way of life. I'm numb to feelings. I'm so desensitized and dehumanized that that is, you know, a Monday morning cup of tea. And it was good while it was good and the heroin and the cocaine and the wine produced the effects that I desired. But what do I do when it stops? <laughs> that, that's when you find out who you are. Yeah. And that's so scary. That's when it gets real. Because then you're forced to face everything that, for me, I got high over for years. Yeah. Oof. That's, that's the baseball bat to the face. Like, yeah. Like, you know, it's so funny because people think that the healing journey begins at the rock bottom, but it actually begins in the moment of clarity. My, I always say my bottom, that last one wasn't my lowest by any means, but in reality it was because it came up to meet me, right? Like, I, like I couldn't justify or minimize the severity of the situation anymore. I could no longer blame it on the ex fiance because she's now the ex. I couldn't blame it on the, 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 the father who was a crack addict who taught me how to conduct myself when he went to prison because he's dead. Like, what, what? I'm running out of people and places, the things to put this on. What I think is so interesting about your journey, though, and we haven't touched it, but I want to go into it, not that it's the crux of this conversation. You go from fame and fortune and celebrity and travel and the things that people dream about. You're a pro skater, getting your board with Peralta. You're like doing the thing and I'm a bit younger than you. I'll be 40 very shortly. But my brothers and I, we, even in the hood, this is how powerful what you guys created was with Jackass and CKY. In the hood, we would get blunts and get high at 12 years old and watch your guys' videos. And my little brothers would go and attempt stunts because they're, I love you guys. You're dumb. Let me rephrase that. You were dumb. You were dumb. And like, I would just watch them like, you guys are ridiculous. And then here you are. 38 years old with nothing. What, eight scarves and a, yeah. a bag, torn clothes, a, a needle and a spoon. And a restraining order. And what the f*** are you doing, man? Yeah. What are you doing? Like, how do you even get there? You know, and th this is the, the solution I'm always trying to get to. Like, how do you mitigate the risk of a Brandon? That was the million dollar question. How did I get here? Right? Like, that, that was never what my intentions were. Um, because... Believe it or not, I, as a young kid, I had these goals, I had these dreams, I had these aspirations and ambitions that I was going to be somebody. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, who I was not going to be was my drug addict father. That's who I was not going to be. And I made it a point throughout the majority of my life when I still had a say-so in the matter um, to excel at everything I did in my life to prove that I would never be that bum of a drug addict father called Jerome, who gave birth to me, you know? And um, lo and behold, not only did I become him, I, I like kind of made him look like chum change at the end. Do you, do you think that's like, 
I grew up without a father and my stepdad was a dude. He was a monster guy, my size, six foot three, 200 something beating up a seven year old, you know? And so my measurement for manhood was like, honestly, it was Jay-Z and it was movies and it was bitches and money. Sure. And that's what I chased. And it like, dude, the addiction was so intense with women. I only had what I've only shared this one time ever. I'm going to share it with you because I want to create this space. I've only had one nickname in my entire adult life that wasn't coach. And in my 20s, my friends called me MySpace whore. Okay. Because I'm out here just hooking up with every chick I can connect with on the internet, chasing that high three, four chicks a day. Like literally it was out of control. I'm shocked that I don't have 400 kids. Yeah. But it was like, if I can fill the hole of this fatherlessness and be better than him, right? Because then it became about money and became about being like this influence and all these things. And then I found like, a, there was nothing I would ever fill that hole with externally. Mm -hmm. How did you, like, when I think about that journey and you're like measuring yourself to your father and you're on this deep, deep, painful journey, what was your thoughts about your relationship with him? Did you subconsciously or even consciously think to yourself, I'm walking in his footsteps? Later on down the road, I had the clarity and peace of mind to see reality for what it looked like. Um, but as cunning as addiction is, I actually use that to continue enabling my behaviors with my mother. Right? What does my, that mean? My mother, I'd live with my mother and my father was around enough to let us know he wasn't around. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, he, uh, I'd be out skating and I'd come home from skating with my friends and, and he'd be in the kitchen making dinner. And we had just like packed up in the middle of the night and literally ran out of the house in fear of our lives, hiding from him, you know, selling homes, ducking, dodging, just. And then I'd come home and he'd just be in the kitchen making dinner as if nothing had happened and mm -hmm. no one skipped a beat. Uh, you know, and it was that. So as my addiction progressed, living with my mother, stealing from her, becoming him, right? Stealing the car when she'd go to bed, stealing her purse, stealing her pocketbook, stealing her money, anything that again would enable my addiction, I would do while living under the roof with her. And, and when she would kind of attempt to create these boundaries and, and hold firm that like, I was not going to do those things under her roof. <clears throat> my immediate go-to was, well, if you didn't marry my father or let dad back in, I wouldn't be this way. When that was not the case. But again, that's just. It feels logical. Yeah. Right. You know, and yeah. I, and I would, I, and I think I meant it too. I, yeah. I definitely meant it at the time for sure. It, it's amazing what we will justify. Yeah. Yeah. Man, some of the shit that I've done, like, I remember one point I'm 26 and I'm in a relationship and this woman, like, bless her heart. I feel bad for any woman who knew me in my teens or twenties. And it was like, there's no way she didn't know about all the other people, but we turned a blind eye to it. And that's what love does. Yeah. Love makes you do crazy things. Even love from your mother or your mother's mm -hmm. love for you. Sure. Because there must have been moments where you're just like, why is she letting this happen? Oh, for sure. For sure. You know, and, and that's, I can relate to that because now what I do is help people for a living and I can help any stranger in the world, but God forbid you're, you're someone that I'm personally invested or connected to. And I, I love in one way, shape or form, I'm not the one to help you because sure. I'll start believing that you are different than the million other people. And maybe you can do this one specific thing and have a different outcome than all the rest, you know, love will, will blur the lines. So mm. I, I get that. And you want to see the good in people, you know, I don't, who wants to see their, their father, their mother be this womanizing or who just takes from the woman you love the most and just completely walks all over everything. You know? Yeah. And then you walk in those shoes. Totally. And then you have to look in the mirror. Yeah. When going back, do you remember the first time you got high? 
I remember the first time I stuck a needle in my arm. The first okay. time I ingested a drink or a drug, the very first one, no recollection at all. Um, because my story isn't one of like, I was in search of or lacking this. You know, I always talk about skateboarding did for me at a very young age what drugs and alcohol did for me at a later age, right? Mm -hmm. you, you give me that skateboard at the age of seven, you put me in a room with the world's prettiest models, I'll not only believe that they've been waiting for me, but that they're dying to marry me, right? Drugs and alcohol would later on produce that same delusional narrative that I really believe. So with the skateboard, I, I didn't feel like I was missing out on or needed to be better at or, or felt less than. And the reason why I'm getting so descriptive with that is because I think it's very important. Because if you're anything like me, you'll listen to something like this and hear both of our stories and be like, God, like, I'm so grateful that man or those guys found the answer for which they're looking for. But like, that can't be me. That won't be me, you know, and, and, and justify and minimize the severity of their situation off of the, the depths of the story and tales we're telling. So I've seen me do that. Um, and, and, and the reality is the disease of addiction doesn't discriminate. Right? It does not. It doesn't yell or jail, the White House or the outhouse. The results are all the same. It doesn't give a fuck about your age, race, creed, religion, lack of religion. It, it knows no boundaries. So therefore, I don't remember the first time I ingested a drink or a drug. But what I do remember is the very first time that someone attempted to stand between me and a drink or a drug. Interesting. That's what I remember. It's like war, right? Yeah. Well, it just in, in my story, it, what that looks like is anything or anyone that attempts to stand between me and it must and will go. And, and, and it's not personal at all. It's just business. Yeah. Like it really is. It's really interesting. And again, that that's that justification and people do it in all elements of their life. You can, you can factor out addiction. Yeah. You can replace that with anything. Dude, you just subtract drugs, alcohol with sex, food, porn, gambling. Yeah. It's, that, that's all just the, the, the byproduct of the actual problem. Yeah. Which is the behaviors that lead back to the solution. Yeah. And you, and you're in it. And if you're in it and if you're in it deep enough, yeah. you're like, this is my life. This is the norm. Dude, you know, it's crazy that at 26 years old, I'd made a million bucks and I was $50,000 in debt living paycheck to paycheck. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I'm, that makes sense here, to me. Here's how <laughs> well, I've been, I hate that we're in this club together. Right. But here, here's the reality of it. I would sit and I would just scour the internet trying to find these chicks to hook up with. And my idea was because my drug was women. I grew up with a mother who cut my finger off. I grew up with a racist grandmother. I grew up with women who were abusive and who molested me. And so it's like, I will do whatever the f it takes to get your love and admiration for six to 13 minutes, depending on the night. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> and, and my idea was every single night, I was like, I have to go out on dates to the most expensive restaurants in town and flash this cash and make sure that they know I'm important. Uh -huh. And then you realize that you're, it's not that you're not important. It's that you're actually worthy before that moment even occurs. And I think about constantly trying to define addiction. And, and I want to ask your definition, but mine, mine is the willingness to do whatever it takes to fill an in external source of goodness that makes you internally whole for a moment. And the reason why I smile or laugh, because I, my answer is literally the exact same, just spoken a little differently um, with a slight tweak of a few words, Please. but it's just simply filling this internal void with an external solution to alter the way I feel about this exact moment, time, place, feeling. Did you ever have a moment in where you like, I feel good? Did you ever actually, you know, you talk about. You often hear about, and I've never done heroin. Let's be very clear about this. It's one of the few things I haven't done. Was there ever a moment where you're like, I actually feel amazing on the backside of the high? Under the influence? I'm like, do while I'm caught up? Yeah. Sure. Like, I, it was amazing. I had some of the best times in my life 
while under the influence of whatever I may have been on. But the truth of the matter with my story is, at first it started out as this amazing party doing things that people could like only even dream of at times to at the end turning into like a a full-blown hostage negotiation where I was not allowed to leave, you know, because I, I, I wanted the party to stop and the party had stopped at the end. Mm -hmm. But with my addiction and the, the power, the magnitude, the reality of the situation is that I, I, I lost the ability to have a say so in the matter when it came to my life anymore. Yeah. Which is probably necessary. Oh, absolutely. He, it, it, one million percent is. Because like you were saying before, to get to that place, to, to, to work on the problem, how do I even know it's a problem until I find myself in a position where the pain becomes so bearable that I'm willing to do the thing that I've never really done before, which is admit maybe what I do know is that I don't know. And furthermore, taking it a step further, picking up that phone that feels like 10 billion pounds and, and reaching out and, and not only asking for help, but be willing to show up for it and open-minded to believe what you're saying mm. and blindly step out on faith without reverting back to, to my comfort blanket, which is a nice speed ball that allows me to disconnect reality because all of a sudden I'm, I'm not under the influence. I'm, I'm walking around at this very moment like a stranger in my own skin trying to figure out who the f- let me in and why. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of steps to get to, to that point where then I can start acquiring some knowledge, building up a defense, and learning that, hey, it wasn't until I uncovered the problem that I actually discovered the real problem. And then I had hopes of recovering from the problem. Mm-hmm. That before that, I had no idea it even existed because they were great times. Yeah. And, and that uncovering is inside of honesty. Yeah. Which is the real that part about that, it. <laughs> I only t- I'm only telling the truth and I'm only honest when my back's against the wall. That's exactly right. And you're like, it, it was me. And, I admit it. I and got I'm caught this saying time. that because it might get me out of this. That's right. And you will do anything to get out of it, right? Which is so f- crazy. And and you're in a position where it is ce- your lifestyle is celebrated. Like I was I was thinking about this in the lead up to talking with you today. Growing up watching you and you guys being this you guys being jackass cky the skateboard community the sh- that you guys did growing up and watching that and seeing like the disclaimer on mtv before it would air on like sunday afternoons at five o'clock right you know right after church of course <laughs> it, it's always like don't ever do anything that these guys ever would imagine do it right yeah and you're this impressionable kid looking up to you guys as role models and my thought was like why the are these guys role models? <laughs> totally. Which appeals to our demographic. Ours meaning, you know, a lot of addicts and alcoholics. Because what I know to be true in my story is that when I put my hand up and I, I qualify myself as, as an addict or an alcoholic, all that means is that I'm defiant by nature. I hate authority. And I refuse to conform because I possess this job that generally places me in a lot of positions I don't want to be in. And it allows me to feel a lot of feelings I don't like to feel. And And that job consists of knowing everything. So the moment that you kindly suggest to me what I could ultimately do to save my life, I kindly suggest why you should. Yeah. Because I know. So you tell me not the point of that is tell me, no, I'll tell you yes and show you how it's done. Yeah. You're contrarian by nature. Yeah. Yeah. Like I'm already cut from the cloth of like, if it doesn't make sense to me, it's wrong. Agreed. <laughs> Agreed. Totally. My, my best, one of my very close friends, one of my best friends, Jason, he's an amazing tattoo artist. He's tattooing me a couple of weeks ago and obviously I'm covered, you're covered. And we we're having this conversation. I was just like, dude, I don't know anyone who had like a good childhood who's tattooed. And he was like, I don't think I've ever tattooed anyone who had a good childhood. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and that, that point that I'm leading in that, are, are you familiar with Dr. Gabor Mate? No. So he wrote a book called The Myth of Normal, and it's amazing. I interviewed him a couple of years ago. He's the most world-renowned 
um, childhood trauma expert on planet Earth. Okay. And he said that all addiction, he also wrote an amazing book, dude, you should absolutely, I don't ever recommend people should do anything, but yeah, yeah. if you would take into consideration. Well, I believe that books find people. I don't think that people find books. Agreed. So I love these kind of recommendations. There, There is a, an unbelievable book, A Change in My Life, called In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts. Yes, I have it at my house. Okay, yeah. I've read it. That's Dr. Gabor Monte. Okay, I'm very familiar okay. with him. So his presupposition is that all addiction stems from childhood trauma. Mm -hmm. Mine is that all childhood trauma eventually leads you to where you are in this moment, mm -hmm. right? Both of these things being true, however you want to look at it. Was there like some outside of like, was there a key awful some moment that you think you were trying to get rid of by chasing the drugs and the adrenaline and the chaos and all of the things that shape to create that insane couple of decades of your life? I think looking back, there were a few different reasons that spawned this outcome. Uh, I was incestuous, incestuous with like work ethics and it came from skateboarding as a child and just being relentless and um, not failing. And But the only way I became a guy who didn't fail is by failing enough until I figured out the method that would lead to success. And that takes a lot of work. And I did that through skateboarding. And I tried a trick for, for days, weeks, months, years. And, and it really instilled in me um, a lot of ethics and core values that I live by today, which is that like failure is not an option. Um, no is unacceptable. Skateboarding weeds out the quitters, for sure. Mm -hmm. I believe this. But in doing so, that becomes tiring. Becomes tiring. That, coupled with the fact that I believe I'm genetically predisposed for my father's addiction and his father's addiction, um, it runs in our bloodline. I was raised and kind of morphed into you know, um, something that wasn't going to be good. Uh, my father would take me to the strip joint and he'd be in the back conducting business and the dancing girls would sit me at the bar and pour shots of ginger ale and Coca-Cola and the shot glasses. You know, I would do the shots that the girls would applaud. My father would give me that look of approval. Pure grooming. Yeah, for sure. I, I was being groomed. Uh, for for a, for an interesting uh I don't know case study if you will <laughs> and uh and and you know I remember driving around me him and my father I was the only kid by my father my brother and sister were by a different man they had no issues like I did but my father also had another kid by another woman. And it would be me, that brother, and my father driving around. I remember they'd be smoking herb and they would they would hide it when they were driving past the cop car. You know, like I remember the behaviors. I didn't know what was happening at the moment. But I was being groomed for that lifestyle, for sure. Unbeknownst to me. Because as, you know, as a child, you're a sponge and you just kind of absorb that to where it became pretty normal. And I remember him paying the, uh, you know, the... The, 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 I lived in Baltimore and they're called the BG&E, the Baltimore Gas and Electric Company. And they come out and they read your meters to see what kind of electricity you're using through your houses. And, and he had set up this elaborate weed farm in the basement. And I remember him paying the BG&E guy to stick a piece of copper or something in there to kind of break up the amount or watts he was using to grow this so they didn't Pick, you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. I, I remember him telling me before when we were selling the house, don't you say a word to this real estate woman about that room in the back. You know, I remember that stuff. And uh, yeah. It's so wild how those moments Im impress on you, your understanding of the world. Because you're a child and you don't know anything. Totally. And, you know, I would watch my mother hustle people. I, mm -hmm. She once sued a major, major retail corporation for a lot of money and won. My dad was a sue happy guy, too. Oh, yeah, he dude. He liked to sue. It was crazy to watch mm -hmm. her 
get in accidents. I'm doing air oh, quotes yeah, if yeah, you're I'm listening. I'm very familiar with those accidents. <laughs> You know, and then be like, you know, the water company would come turn our water off and she would teach us how to hustle and get the water back on or, you know, go across the street and steal it from the neighbors. Mm -hmm. She was always the last one to show up to the the parent teacher conference, normally high or drunk. And Mm -hmm. that that becomes acceptable. And you think about that and you're like, well, no wonder my life got so. How could it not? Sure. You do have the outliers. Like, let's be clear. You and I both know people who they had childhoods who they're they're great a lot of things have just worked in their direction i'm the kind of guy being like you a contrarian by nature at five years old i stuck a fork in the electrical socket after being told not to sure because i need to know yeah i need to know and if you're always in that place of i need to know it leads you down this path where you will destroy everything to find out Mm -hmm. and when you do that man there's just so much shame and so much guilt and pain. How how do you reconcile some of the things that you've done and the experiences that you've been through when it comes to shame and guilt? I had a spiritual experience. That's how I reconciled all those that at one point in time were the defects in my life that have now, because of that spiritual experience, has become the assets Again, the poison becoming the medicine. Um, I started looking at the part that I played in it. I, I, I surrounded myself with with some really good mentors that that took their time with me and and they taught me about the reality of the disease that I had been diagnosed with a long time ago. And and to make it even more layered or complex, if you will, as if it needs to be, with addiction. I was a product of that environment. All of those negative things that you were talking about, I can relate to. And, and it's funny, right? You and I are are very similar. And, and I think at parts of our journey, being in the same place, we were staring at like a particular painting, but having two different outcomes or, or takeaways from this painting, because like you were talking about, just like it, here we go. We're in it for the ride. Let's keep. I, on the other hand, looked at my father and, and said, you know what? I will never, ever become him. And I will make it a point to excel at skateboarding well enough that like, I will be a successful, productive family guy that shows up and doesn't hurt his, his children or his wife and doesn't cheat on his wife. You know, I, I really, I, and, and, and that at the full circle moment is one of the blessings that I've had from that spiritual experience because the definition of a spiritual experience is simply a psychic change, meaning that I no longer look at things the way I did then and it allows me to be great at playing devil's advocate. So when someone calls me and says, I, I want help, but I'm only doing it this way, or I don't want your fucking help. I don't need your help. Where generally it's pretty easy for one to get very agitated, angry, annoyed, discouraged. Why can't you see that this is the right way? This is the way to the promised land. Oh, I, I've seen me do what they are doing. You know, so I, I think... Although at the time, same as you, I was so consumed by the mess that I was incapable of seeing the message. Once I bought into this process and I really took advantage of, of the suggestions from really intelligent people that had my sincere best interest at heart, uh, I could reap the benefits and, and, and the rewards of that journey. And uh, it allows me to see that everyone's exactly where they're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. everyone 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 and i accept them for where they're supposed to be um but that's the 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 magnitude of the of the the place we're in with the enemy we're up against which is addiction you know this epidemic is is unlike anything i've ever seen but there is a way out yeah 
There is. And yeah. that, that support you talked about, man, it's so necessary. You know, I went to the first time I ever walked into AA, I was seven and I was there with my mother. And I just remember my, my understanding of addiction and what it really does to a human has drastically shifted with more knowledge. Yeah. When I was young, I'm um, in AA, I would look at guys like you. I'd be like, that guy's weak. Totally. That guy. Sure. My mom's weak. Her. Yeah. yeah. My stepdad's weak. Him. Right. Because you're a child and you're like, we don't have food, mm -hmm. but you have a bag of weed on top of the TV stand. Totally. And we don't have electricity, but somehow there's a six pack on ice in the bedroom. Mm -hmm. and we don't have new clothes for school, but there's these orange pill bottles all over the bedroom floor. Yeah. And so you look at it, you go, these people. And then I realized that through my own work and my own recovery and different elements of my life and my own healing journey, that really what it is, it's these hurt fucking people trying to hide from the most painful experience of their life. Mm -hmm. And they do have a lot of shame. They do carry a lot of guilt. But I think the cornerstone and the thing that shifted for me was what you just said. It was like, they're fucking humans, man. That's, you know, really what we are as human beings, not human doings. And this life didn't come with an instruction manual. And for a lot of years, I carried a lot of baggage for my father. And again, so interesting, the parallels to our stories, staring at the same piece of art, but having two completely different perspectives of it. You went there and saw all these weak fucking people. I went there and saw my fucking father. I'll never be you, mm. right? Uh, which prolonged my inevitable, right? It kept me out there longer. It allowed me to justify and and minimize my behaviors, right? Cause I'm not, I'll never be him. I excelled at everything to prove why I wasn't or going to be. Therefore, I just kind of skirted around facing the facts of my situation. And then, uh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's really interesting to me. You can't run from it though. You know, and that, that's the thing that I, I, my brother called me 23, almost 24. My brother called me and he goes, uh, Hey man, mom died. And Brandon, it was the most peaceful day of my life because it was like, I was finally free. Yeah. And I did not get to reconcile with her while she was alive. I don't necessarily regret it, but I will say this. It took a lot of work to get to a place called forgiveness. And one day I'm sitting in my therapist's office. I moved to Portland, Oregon, of all places, 2,000 miles away from anything that I knew to go and work with this guy who was like fucking incredible. Um, and I'm sitting in his office one day and I, I literally look at him just like this. I go, I'm so fucking tired of seeing your face every week, dude. And I meant it, right? Because for years, every Wednesday night, I'd sit in the same chair, drink the same chamomile tea and look at his fucking face and be like, I cannot stand this. And this one day I just go, dude, I'm just, I'm done. I don't want to be with you or in this anymore. Why do I have to work on fixing problems I didn't cause? And he said something to me that changed my life forever. And he goes, have you ever paused and just thought about what your mom's childhood was like? Mm -hmm. And that was it. Yeah. My whole, my whole shit changed in a fucking moment. But there were, I mean, obviously totally. moments leading up to that. Were you able to reconcile with your father? Hey, what's up, guys? We'll be right back to the show. But before we do, I want to tell you about our other sponsor for today's episode, 310nutrition.com, where if you go there, you can use the code UNBROKEN to save up to $100 on your first order. Guys, you know that I'm a firm believer in the body mind connection when it comes to mental health and what you put in your body is just as important as the things you put into your mind. As you know, one of the things that I do is I'm super busy, always on the go, speaking, stages, podcasts, coaching, writing books, and hanging out with you guys, the Unbroken Nation. I don't always have time to eat the proper meal, but I do want to make sure that I put the right foods in my body. And right now I'm drinking a shake, literally called chocolate 
icing. It's an all-in-one meal. Guys, it has superfoods, vitamins, and minerals, and even probiotics. It's unbelievably delicious. And here's what's crazy. Like there's broccoli and beetroot and apple and ginger and turmeric in here. And it tastes like I'm literally eating icing out of one of those jars. As you know, chocolate cake is one of my favorite meals of all time. And so the fact that I can have it in a healthy way that is sustainable for my mind and body is everything. So go over to 310nutrition.com, use the code UNBROKEN for 50% off up to $100 on your first order. It's funny you said that. Even I had one of those moments too, and it came by way of me seeing a therapist and I'm sitting in her office and I'm still getting loaded at the time, but I'm, I'm making a, a somewhat vain attempt to, to get better. And she said, uh, I want you to do me a favor, Brad. And I said, what's that? She said, I want you to dig two graves. I said, for what? She said, one for you and one for all this baggage that you carry. Mm-hmm. And, and I may have heard that before, but this day, the timing, the place, the space, it aligned and it hit. It made a lot of sense to me and, and, and it allowed me to kind of look back at our relationship throughout time. And, and what I knew to be true is that Jerome, my father, was a good man and he did the best that he could with what he had. He was a sick man. And how dare I fault him because I fucking became him. You know what I mean? Like, the, the gall of me, but not really because I, I, I was ignorant to the facts and I had this tunnel vision on and I only saw it the way I believed it should have been seen. You know, I, I, and then someone came along, her, Christina, my therapist, and she changed my perspective. And she taught me when you change your perception, you could change your world. And at that moment, I started to heal. And I remember I, when my father died, they, uh, he had nothing left and they, they donated his body to science just so they could have him cremated for free because no one was going to foot the bill for that. And, uh, and after it had taken place, they were going to put his ashes out with the trash. And mm-hmm. I said, fine. But my sister, of all people who really didn't like my father, she said, you should go get those. And I went and I got those. And um, I took those ashes back to this house where we grew up and I jumped the fence and sat behind this tree next to a pool and, and I emptied the ashes and I'm still getting loaded. And I hadn't even began any work on healing myself and the internal voyage I was about to embark on. This is strictly face value, pain mm-hmm. becoming great enough, seeing things with a different perspective. And and I, I, I got rid of the ashes and I I actually made amends to him before I got sober. And, and I really wish if I, I had the chance to go back and, and give him a hug and say, I, I love you, man. And I understand it's okay. And I am not upset with. That's freedom, dude. It is. People don't get it, man. Like I try to explain this way. Like when I'm coaching my clients and they've been through this dark shit and they have backgrounds like ours, I'm like, you got to let go. Yeah. If I gave you a backpack full of bricks, how long are you going to carry that, man? I got tired of shooting dope at you. (laughs) Fuck, man. Like, We'll be right back to the show. But before we do, I want to tell you about today's sponsor, Factor Mills. Dot com, where if you go to factormills.com slash unbroken50 and use the code unbroken50, you can get 50% off your first order. That's factormills.com slash unbroken50. If you're like me and you are a person who is busy trying to create a life, heal, work on their health, wealth, and relationships, and not to mention deal with the day-to-days of normal life, you do not have time to be going to the grocery store and trying to figure out what you're going to cook every single day of the week. In fact, one time I did the math and I realized I was spending over 15 hours a week at the grocery store and cooking. When I added factor, I got to use that time for myself, for my family, for my friends, for my community, and for my business. And so if you're in the place where you need some more support in the kitchen, head to factormills.com slash unbroken50 and use the code unbroken50 to get 50% off. But the, you know, and the, the sooner I, I stop 
pointing outward and faced it inward, then I could actually create some form of change. You know, so, so what I've learned throughout my journey is there's no such thing as their part. There is no their part. Everything comes back to self, good, bad, or indifferent. If I'm here and I'm agitated with you, it's something within me that's creating this agitative state where I'm uneasy. It has nothing to do with you. Every decision we've ever made has led to this moment. Literally, literally. If you would have absolutely, if you would have been across from twelve-year-old me smoking a blunt, listening to Outcast, in Indianapolis, in Indianapolis, watching fucking CKY videos with your face on there, doing the dumbest shit yeah, a human yeah. could ever fucking do, and you said, "I'll give you a billion dollars if you can tell me in twenty-five years." that you'll be sitting across from this man talking to him. I'd be like, you're fucking crazy. Say, and, and I would say the same. People will call me because I give my number out for people that want help and I'll answer and they'll be like, ah. they hang up or they don't believe it's me. And they like, ah, I, I wasn't expecting to, to talk to you today. And I say, well, the fucking feeling's mutual, right? <laughs> yeah, like, totally, and, and dude. And the truth of the matter is, yeah. I was ignorant to this. But once I had that spiritual experience and I, I, I became aligned with, with a higher power and, you know, kind of you spot it, you got it. And and I see these synchronicities. It's very easy for me to look back and recognize the synchronicity in life's events that have landed me literally to the right here, right now, that proved to me, the God of my understanding, my higher power has been doing so much more, so much broader and bigger than my feeble mind could ever conceive. Like, why aren't I in the next apartment in the next building, talking to the next gentleman. You know what I mean? Like this little skate rat from Baltimore City who's five, six years older than you. Um, why here? Why it, Nothing is done by chance. Because it was meant to be. Everything is destiny and fate. I agree with that. I was, I was having a conversation with my mentor, just an amazing man who has supported me tremendously in my, my career, more so than probably the past. But there's little nuances that he presents to me that just like, mm-hmm. you know, because that's what it is. It's like someone sits across from you and tells you the thing that you need to hear and everything becomes different. And one day we're having this really incredible dinner. I mean, the people pay this dude hundreds of thousands of dollars for one-on-one time. And he asked nothing of me except to come to dinner with him. And we're having dinner and we're talking. And I was telling him, like, dude, I'm frustrated. Like, I feel like I hit this wall in the business. Yes, I've got all these clients. Yes, I'm on Times Square billboards, all these things, but like something's off. And he just said something to me that was so profound. He goes, don't ever forget that you're being protected and promoted at all times. Hmm. At all times, you're being protected and promoted by something that loves you more than your own mother. Mm -hmm. And he told me that, dude, and I'm telling you, it just changed the way I think about the world. And so in these moments of serendipity, right, or synchronicity or coincidence or however you want it to look like, you are meant to be here. Absolutely. But how do you, how do you know that you're meant to be here and you look back on the past and you go, but I was meant to be there too. And that past is fucking ugly. And I did bad things and I hurt people and I broke the law and I went to jail and I, God knows all the things I haven't even talked about. How do you, how do you navigate that? We talked about it. We, we touched on it briefly earlier, but I truly believe that we are all entitled to our process. And if anyone, anyone, anyone would have robbed me of any part of my process, whether it be one less night of sleeping on the streets, one less, um, car that I got into to prostitute my body, one less trash can that I ate out of, one less needle that I shared. I really do not believe that I would be the child of God that I am today who has devoted his life in helping others. I I, I do not believe that. I am asked often, would you take back or do you regret anything from the past? And my stock answer for so long was, the only thing I would take back is the pain and the sleepless nights that I caused my mother and other loved ones. But the more I thought about it, the more I think that's a fucking lie. Mm -hmm. Because again, if someone would have robbed me of one less night of my mother sleeping because she stayed awake crying over me, buying me a plot, waiting for my death, 
I don't believe that that would have inspired some kind of willingness to find a better way of life, right? Like I don't believe that without the repercussions as a direct result of my actions, AKA behaviors, any change would have ever taken place. I don't believe that. And I, I work a 12 step program and, and the third step in my program is turning my will and my life over to my higher power. And I've experienced that. So any time throughout my day when I am full of fear at any level, all that is is lack of faith. Me stating that I don't believe in 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 the entity that's carried me when I couldn't carry myself. Yeah, it's impossible that you're here. Yeah. By the way, I yeah. don't know if you knew this or not. The legit it makes no sense. No, it defies logic. Yeah. And it's a blessing. It, it's like that old adage. It's like the truth is funnier yeah. than any story. Yeah. Yeah. And and I can get so consumed in the the the, the rigmarole and the the day to day of things that I I forget I forget when all I wanted and prayed for was to just get sober but didn't even believe that that was possible. So anything else is just a fucking added bonus. <laughs> I didn't think I'd make it till 18. Yeah. You know. I'm on borrowed time, man. Yeah, and you know what? Maybe that makes me a little bit more willing to jump off the diving board. Yeah. Do the crazy thing. Not crazy like they used to be, but now like take the bigger risks in business and relationships and my own personal journey. Because I'm like, dude, I don't know. Like I, it's so crazy to me when I'm, I'm young and people are like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I remember just literally telling a teacher one time, I was like alive. Mm -hmm. There was, I didn't think I'd be here. Sure. And I know a lot of people listening to this don't think that they should either, but it's like, it's divine, whether or not you're spiritual or religious, or you believe in God or Buddha or Allah, what, like whatever, like we are these eternal beings who chose this life. Well, that's what I, I believe this in my heart of hearts, but all those really, what one would consider traumatic experiences and, and hellish things to have to endure. I choose to see that as me being divinely inconvenienced <laughs> at the highest level. <laughs> and, and that's, that's exactly what it is. That's it. My, you know, yeah, I, 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 don't, I, I also, I, I often get discouraged about really getting into like, uh, God talk because I know that that can be very discouraging mm -hmm. to people yeah. and I don't ever want to turn anyone off for, for what I'm saying or how I'm saying it. What I do know is I never gave much stock to the God thing. You know, people say, I, I don't, that God, that God. And, and the reality of my story is that the pain that brought me into recovery far outweighed the fear of learning about this imaginary God, <laughs> like, or shall I say the, 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 the 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 fear of returning back to active addiction far outweighed the talks of this imaginary figure that was going to do for me what I couldn't do for myself. So all I know is that I don't know what God is or isn't. I don't know if it's a man in the sky with a with a robe and a beard, a woman, a sun, the universe. What I do know is that it's not me. Yeah. It's a power greater yeah. than me. So yeah, I, I believe that, you know, without the things that I've been made to endure, um, how could I understand others who are enduring the same thing? Yeah. I could never help all of the people that I help. No. I never could. No know. one would want me to. No, of course not. They'd be like, what are you talking about, dude? It's like- We can spot it. Yeah, if for you sure. you got it or you don't. Yeah. And I'm going to tell in a very brief, period of a conversation, whether that we're on the same wavelength or, you know, you're just kind of doing what you do for whatever reason. For sure. Yeah. Well, we're humans and we all like, I'm very empathic. Yeah. Same. I, I feel energy. You can, it, to be honest, like it prop, I think it might be more nurture than nature coming from the background, needing to read people for safety, mm -hmm. needing to understand like, what do you want from me? 
Am I safe in this moment? And really being able to pick up on energy very well. And when you're in connection with people. My life depended on that. Dude, a hundred fucking percent. Yeah. And then it's like, when I'm in connection with people, like, bro, you can't fucking lie to me. Yeah. It's almost impossible. Yeah. No one rarely gets anything over on me because I've been able to harness that gift. Mm -hmm. Then it allows me to help people. But you know, it's real fucked up. I'm real good at lying to myself. I know that. There's a reason why I'm a 45 year old single man that lives with three cats. <laughs> it's because like, is it a, because I really do genuinely love myself and, and like I'm self-sufficient and, and, and I will not just give my time to anybody. Or is it the fact that I refuse to look at certain areas of my life because there's a lot of work that's entailed there. And, and am I willing to do the things that I don't really want to do? Well, like, the work doesn't stop. Yeah. Ever. What are you scared of? Like what, what really fucks you up right now? Being vulnerable to someone close. Hence another layer of why I'm single. I, I, I do a lot of, I don't do a lot of spiritual retreats, but I do them. I just got back from one in Mammoth and, and I really enjoy digging deep and, and seeing what's going on with me. Cause there's a lot of fucking baggage in me that I haven't even tapped into yeah. yet. Well aware of that. Um, and the newest revelation that was shown to me is that I'm scared to be vulnerable to someone intimately. I can do it with a, 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 a stadium of thousands of people. I can as transparent as you want, but God forbid, like you're in my personal space. And that's a direct result of things I endured from my father. Yeah. Same journey. I mean, I'm, I'm in that myself right now. And I ask myself, is the very thing keeping me safe, keeping me empty, mm -hmm. right? It's the golden handcuff for sure. scenario. Yeah. And my, my hope is no, and I continue to do the work, but it's, dude, it's fucking terrifying. Getting your heart ripped out. It's not, yeah, it's not, it's not enjoyable. It's not like I wake up and I'm really excited about this task. Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, but you don't want to be the fucking 65 year old guy with six cats. For sure. So on some days, <laughs> <laughs> but no, and the older I get, the, the worse it, or better it gets because I've been blessed with this amazing life and I can kind of create the schedule and, and I'm really set my ways and my routine. And it's, it's, it's only getting harder to let someone come into that space and, and, and about. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Or maybe that's exactly what you need because you have gotten really good. That's at That's what routine. my therapist says. You know. she, she's tasked me with jobs of like coming home and um, throwing like pillows and blankets in the middle of my floor because yeah, everything has a spot. And you, you walked into my place. It's, same it's, deal. Bro. Not a dish in the sink, book to be out of, everything is mine same way. Yeah. It's control. Uh -huh. It's safety, right? And it's the thing that makes Which is the, something I never had. Yeah, of course. Same. Which is why I do it. And like when I've dated women- in the past, and I'm like, there's toothpaste in, bro, if there's toothpaste yeah. in this, get out. Mm -hmm. We've been together six years, just leave. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, I'm good at, I, I much prefer just to, to just cut and walk. I don't want to drag this out. I don't want to have a conversation about it because then I have to be vulnerable and I have to sit there and be exposed as a raw nerve and endure these really uncomfortable feelings. Yeah, but that's the game, That's dude. That's where the growth, I get it. I know it. I, I, I get it. Right. It's I, like, how do you, I believe it. I'm yeah. just not quite willing to, to embark on it yet. Well, that's the heart. Well, the yet is the key word, right? Cause the yet creates opportunity. If I'm you, willing. Yeah. When the opportunity presents itself aligned with the timing and the pain. Yeah. And, <laughs> and it's, and it's like, and then don't ignore it. Right. This yeah. is what I keep reminding myself. Sure. It's like, dude, don't fucking ignore it. Don't ignore it. If it's right, it's right. Roll with it. Yeah. Because it's like, you can only protect your heart so much, dude. Yeah. You, and then you're like, man, you, there's, there's a book I read called the regret of the dying and everyone that sounds interesting, dude, it's phenomenal. And the, the people who have been on their deathbeds, their biggest regret is never about the business or fucking podcast, this nonsense. Right. It's always like, I didn't love deep enough. Yeah. I didn't show up enough. I didn't forgive enough. I didn't. Instead of working that extra day, I should have went to the baseball game and watched mm -hmm. my kid hit that home run. And it's like the number of relationships I've lost over the years chasing. Yeah. It's like, why? Filling this internal void with that external solution. Right. I have this uh, card that an ex 
gave to me. <laughs> um, and she's still a very close friend of mine. And it's on the mirror walking out of my house. And it says, uh, pay attention to the little things in life because one day those little things become the big things. Mm -hmm. And it's just a, a, a smile shared, you know, a memory made, a laugh had. Far off from like new business created, another house purchased. Those aren't the things that I remember looking back. I mean, they're great, but generally they happen so quick that it's just kind of a splash in the pan. But I remember like those little odd, quirky things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because those are the things that, those are the experience. You're having, yeah. you, you're remembering something. I am, now. I totally am. Yeah, you man. know, and, and you remember those experiences and it's like, bro, I've never, I've never been on a first class seat. I've never been in a stadium speaking on stage. I've never done anything that brought me more joy than like hanging out with my boys and having dinner. Yeah. Waking up next to her, whoever mm -hmm. she is, mm -hmm. hugging my little brothers and, and kissing my nephew on the forehead. Yeah. Like we're so lied to man about what it means to be a man, to be a man of value, to be a man of substance and character. And I see you now right knowing your path and your journey doing my due diligence to try to have an amazing conversation of this nature thank you for that no for sure dude and the the thing that i take away more than anything about you is you went from selfish to selfless yeah you know i just kind of like um i think again timing and alignment is so crucial with one's journey and for me these seeds were continuously planted along my journey, my process. And, and at the end, when the timing and the space and the, the stars just aligned, it's like the, the skies parted and I just walked across the sea and everything that people tried to get through to me literally just like erupted out of the ground. This, this full blown beautiful tree just kind of grew in the blink of an eye. And, and it all made sense to me. And it, it all became really clear what they were saying then. And then uh, upon embarking on my own journey and surrounding myself with, with, with my people and having these experiences and these spaces, uh, what's beautiful and freeing for me today is that the longer I stay sober, the more that I know that I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. And, and, and what better thing for an alcoholic such as myself, who, who really was not a big fan of accepting responsibility than to have the ability to relinquish control <laughs> <laughs> and just like give it to something else that isn't me. And I always say this thing works when I don't work it, mm -hmm. right? I, it's impossible for me to use the very same brain that thought me into this problematic space to in turn think me out of it. So I'm a big fan of understanding that the behaviors of the problem, the drinking, the drugging, the porn, the sex the, is the solution. So if we know the behaviors of the problem, the, or, or the behaviors, the behaviors of the problem, the, the drinking is the solution. If I, uh, if I take my brain out of the equation and I just continue to bring the body surrounded by good, like-minded people with my best intentions at heart, I will create a better outcome. Think less, do more. Just bring the body, bring the body, bring the body. It's inevitable that the mind will follow. You know, I, I truly just had to dumb myself into this equation. And then once I got to this spot where, where I think from the, uh, from the external perspective, people say, he's got it figured out. In my mind, I'm still waiting for the grown up to show up and take care of everything. <laughs> and, uh, and that's a beautiful place to be in because I'm not uh, placing expectations on, on things, places, or people that I'll never have the ability to control. So it makes my life lighter and easier to maneuver through. Yeah. And I'll add an and to your sentence, if you don't mind. You're of tremendous service. And you don't have to be. And you created Novak's house. Mm. And you speak. I, I remember the first time 
Because I was like, I, I just assumed you were dead, just to be honest. Yeah. Right. You know, which you probably hear all the time. And I was like on Instagram two years ago, maybe something. And I saw this clip of you talking just about your journey. And I was like, that is so crazy. This dude's still alive. <laughs> and now you're of service. Yeah. Talk about Novak's house. Like, what is that about? What does it do for you? And what does it do for those men? You know, it's funny. I'm, I'm simply a product of that environment. I went to a very similar sober living house after I completed a 90 day inpatient treatment center stay. And, and that house did for me, it bridged the gap where the ball was always dropped before and it did for me what, I don't want to say what no other place it ever did, but more so it, it did for me what I would never allow any other place to do. Yeah. And, um, and it taught me how to reintegrate or merge back into society. It taught me how to like make my bed. It taught me how to, to, to wash my clothes, to brush my teeth consecutively, consistently, right? Because that was my problem, the behaviors. And I was rather erratic and sporadic mm -hmm. and, and irrational and just wherever, whenever. But this place taught me consistency. It taught me um, how to continue to show up in spite of what the problematic brain told me over and over. It taught me how to set a, a, a set of non-negotiable standards that I have to hold myself to when I don't fucking feel like it. And, um, and, and, and it, it taught me how to hold my head up a little bit higher and speak with a little bit more conviction and be a little less fearful of what you think of me when I leave here today. And, and I, I never could forget the power that that house, you know, had over me in a positive way. It, it really, it, it, it held me accountable to a set of standards I didn't even know existed. And I couldn't forget that. It was a magical experience. So I promised myself when I was in a position, I was financially, I would recreate that house. And I did with a gentleman who I also lived in that house with who's like one of my best friends now. And, and we opened up Novak's house. It was one house with 10 beds. And that was on my fifth year anniversary, literally May 25th. And, um, and today there's six houses with 65 beds. And, and I travel around and I, I raise money um, to provide scholarships for any man in need. My, my mission statement is to to never allow resources or lack thereof finances to be a deterrent as to why someone can't find adequate, safe, accountable, sober places to reside in. And that's what we did. And, and unfortunately we're growing at a rapid pace. I wish that wasn't the case. I wish that my service wasn't in demand and, and Novak's house was bang. I truly wish that was yep. the case. I get that. But it's not. And, uh, I, I know that I can create anything I believe in, so I'll meet the need. No, same. Everything I built and think unbroken is with one mission that hopefully I'm obsolete one day. Mm -hmm. I'm like, what the f do I have to do so that I'm not necessary? Yeah. It's a weird, ch it's a challenge, right? And it's a, it is the ultimate challenge. And it, I, it's, I have just come to recognize that it will not happen in my lifetime. And I'm okay with oh, that, for sure. but I will do whatever the fuck it takes to make sure it happens on some lifetime. Mm -hmm. I want to go back to that house. You said a lot of things that taught you how to brush your teeth, how to be responsible, how to make your bed. Dude, when I started my journey, like brushing my teeth, I was like, what? Yeah. I got to brush my teeth, which is insane, right? Yeah. You're like the normal person doesn't go through that. But in the, the depth of depression and anxiety and suicidality that I was in after putting a gun in my mouth, I was like, dude, if I can just brush my teeth today, I fucking won the championship. For sure. Right. Did it teach you how to love yourself? It did, but not by way of just looking in the mirror saying, I love me, you know, like the positive affirmations. It didn't come by way of that. Everything that I've achieved in my life to this point All the good that sometimes I believe I've played a part in creating. It's happened unbeknownst to me, right? Um, to come back to that, I showed up in sobriety, recovery, 
the eight scarves, the jacket, the, the, the needle, the spoon, the restraining order, fit into this bag that doubles my pillow, homeless. And so it was pretty, pretty safe to say I, I lacked self-esteem, mm. right? And that was evident. It was apparent. I knew it. I'd tell you it. But the only problem was I didn't know how to find it. I didn't know where to get it. I didn't know how to implement this thing that I knew I didn't have, but didn't know where to get into my life. And if I knew how and where to get it and do it, I would have done it and not ended up in a 12-step program. But what happened is I was beaten and broken so bad, I was finally demoralized in just such a fashion from drugs and alcohol. I literally beaten into a state of reasonableness that I, I came in and surrounded myself with, with really good people who had my best interest at heart. And I, I bought into their suggestions and I, I was open-minded long enough to follow through with what they told me to do. And, 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 and I got a job at a diner washing dishes, Marianne's diner for $6 an hour under the table at 38. And I had heard that word humility, but it never really made much sense because I never applied it to me. It sounded good, but it just was what it was. And, and, uh, at the time, my brain told me I should have at least been the president of the United States, not washing dishes at Marianne mm -hmm. Diner for $6 an hour next to a 14-year-old kid named Brian. But nonetheless, that job, little did I know, was going to become like one of the, the, the foundation stones of not only my sobriety, but my life. And uh, my mentor said, you... you, you you show up to work 15 minutes early. You stay 15 minutes late. You take pride in every dish that you wash. You make that restaurant as successful as possible. And you look at what you can bring to the table, not take from. And I did that. And what happened was through washing those jobs at that, what I thought was a very meaningless job, um, dead end, no end game in sight, I was going to start making a couple bucks. And with the couple bucks I made, I was going to open up my own checking account, not with one where a woman's name's attached. I'm going to start paying my own $165 a week sober living. I'm going to then start paying bi-weekly. I'm going to start buying my own groceries, my own cigarettes I smoked at the time. I'm going to I'm going to take it a step further. I'm going to go to the TD bank and I'm going to I'm going to open up a pre-secured credit card. Right? And and, and through doing these esteemable acts, following the suggestions, right, bringing the body, bringing the body, all of a sudden these esteemable acts turned into self-esteem. And I started speaking with a little bit more conviction. I started to hold my head up a little bit higher and tell you how I felt without fear of what you thought. And, uh, and, and that pre-secured credit card turned into a credit card. That credit card turned into four credit cards. One's an American Express with no limit. Um, you know, that 165 a week that I was paying that turned into my biweekly rent at a sober living house has turned into me owning not only one home, but like five, you know, um, in turn, right. Seeing and recognizing what my God had done for me, stepping out on faith, really believing in the power of, I said, you know what? I, I've acquired enough knowledge. More importantly, I have a really great relationship with my higher power and that, that sees in me what I don't see in myself. And I believe that I can create um, something bigger, something broader, something better than Novak's house. And, and I created Redemption Addiction Treatment Center. And it's kind of like Novak's house on steroids. But in doing so, I, 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 I borrowed money from three different people. I spent every dollar I had and I maxed out every one of those credit cards, took a hit on my credit. And uh, I swear to God, there's days, well, there were days where I, my head was so heavy that I just couldn't wear it anymore. I, I was getting beat by this thing called business, just tiring. And I'd come home and I'd open up my closet and I'd pull that bag out that used to double as my pillow. And I would stare at that bag. And, uh, and just yesterday I, I, I paid off all those, those credit card bills that I acquired. Every one of them. Um, I'm, I'm now, you know, seeing the light at the end of that tunnel. I'm the reaping the, the rewards from that, 
that deal. The ends are justifying the means. And what that will do is it will continue to ensue in me and more so ensure in me that like my God is real and, and there's evidence and the evidence comes by way of I'll show you my phone. I had a 22-year-old kid who, from California, he was in um, six different treatment centers. Couldn't ever conceive that he would not only be able to get sober, but stay sober and find like a life that he believed was worth living while sober. And he was one of the first clients that came through redemption and his name is Felix. And this is Felix, two weeks ago, 90 days sober, successfully completed my program, standing in front of Novak's house, waiting for his ride to his first day at college. Mm. That's, that's the fucking faith. Yeah. That like, I, incredible. I, I bet the bank on. And if I would have gave in to what my brain said, which was just stay where you're at. You have a really good position at another facility that pays you very well. You have good health benefits, you know, treading water at best. Then like. That doesn't happen. My favorite, there's a book that changed my life forever. I'm, I'll always bring up books because books change my life. I, I love that. I read The Alchemist. Mm -hmm. Don't know if you've read it or not. Phenomenal story. I think per, it's, it's been my, a minute. Yeah, it's, it's like my favorite personal development book. I left Indiana at 29. I sat down with my best friends at the time and I told them just everything. I told them about the abuse, being molested. I told them about being homeless as a kid, growing up in the Mormon church. I told them about the chaos of watching my friends die, getting kicked out of high school, starting doing drugs when I'm 12. And I was trying to explain to them that I had to go on this journey. I had to leave everything that I knew to go and find out who I am. And I leave and I'm driving, and I'm in Cincinnati and I get the urge. I'm like, call your buddy. So I call my buddy CJ. I say, Hey man, I'm going to be in Cincinnati. Can I just pop by, grab dinner with you? And then I'll be on my way to Salt Lake. Right. I was trying to make that trip in a day. And we go to dinner and we're sitting. He's like, I have a book that you need to read. And you have to come back to my house and you need to read this book, take it with you on your journey because it was given to me. And I was told that when it was right to give it to someone else and it's right for you. And there's a passage in, in the book that I think about Brandon literally every day, fucking every single day, it comes into my head and it's that the universe is always conspiring in your favor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And it just is every time there's no, you cannot fail. If you do not quit, if you got to max yep, every credit card, fucking max every credit hold card. On. If you got to go fucking hold a sign in the middle of the street that says, I need money so I can eat, you go hold the fucking sign. Mm -hmm. If you got to close the business and travel the world and for me, do things that I never imagined I would do, you do it because life is very, I, I have figured out the solution to life is one very simple sentence. You do not do what you want. You do what you have to. Mm-hmm. And if you do not do what you have to do, you don't help Felix. Mm -hmm. You don't totally. fix your, you don't. The, the snowball effect. Who God knows the number of people who are going to listen to this. Mm -hmm. If I don't Legit. do what I have to. Legit. And I wish that more people would step out of victimhood. When you're an addict and you're in that low place and you, and by all means, dude, I'm not taking victimhood from you. Life is fucking hard. Yeah. But at some point you got to decide to be the hero. Mm-hmm. I always say that, you know, I'll never disrespect anybody and pretend to understand the pain that brought them to this seat at this table or on the other end of that computer watching this podcast. I will not disrespect you in that manner. Um, but what I believe in is if your journey brought you to a place to hear this and you recognize more similarities than differences, it might make sense to pay attention. But if not, mm. that's okay. I'll support you in any direction you're headed in. And thinking about it, the redemption, the blessing that came from that was birthed from what at one point in time, I believe was my inadequacies that I was dealt in life, 
right? I had no stable foundation. There was no security. There was no stability. There was no structure. There was no safety. And therefore, that's what I yearned for and always wanted the most. Found that in sobriety, and then it kind of gave birth in all these other different places. But then I got to a place with my last employer where I, I outgrew it, and I knew there was going to come a point in time where from a, a business perspective that that rug was going to be pulled out from underneath me because like they could pay someone else way less to do just as much and more probably. Mm -hmm. So there was only a matter of time before that was going to happen. So I stepped out almost on this faith to just secure the stability that uh, today allows me to never let anyone pull it out from underneath of me. Mm -hmm. right? And it, and. I would have never recognized that unless I did the internal work that was required. Mm. Which required you asking for help. Totally. It, it, it required me to just admit complete defeat. Yeah. <laughs> like when I admitted complete defeat was the exact second I secured the ultimate victory. And what's so, <laughs> yeah, dude, what's so crazy about that is you, you look at your experience and in your life and it, like some people, they're rock bottom your rock, bro, your rock bottom was like fucking <laughs> rock bottom. Like my rock bottom was 350 pounds, smoking two packs a day, drinking yeah. myself to sleep, getting high in the morning, $50,000 in debt, car got repoed, getting kicked out of my place. Girlfriend finds out I'm cheating on her with like fucking 8,000 women. But the one that of all of that, and this isn't a window, we're talking like a month of all this shit going down. The thing that hit me the hardest, though, my little brother, I call him, he had just gotten back from being overseas in Afghanistan, doing his tours, serving our country. And I, he'd been home for months, dude. I hadn't called him, text him, email, or go f nothing. And one day I, I, I'm like, I'm going to change my life today. And I'm in the gym. I'm fat as but I'm in the gym sure. trying. And I call my brother in the gym and, you know, you can hear the vitriol in his voice. And he goes, what do you want? I go, hey, man, I'm just, you know, what's up? How you doing? How's life? You're back. He goes, I've been back. I go, yeah, yeah, I know. And I'm like, I've been over here doing these things, destroying my life, right? And part of it, to be honest, Brent, I just didn't want them to see it. Yeah. It's fucking embarrassing. Mm -hmm. And he goes, and this was the moment for me that really solidified the change. He goes, you're not my brother. Don't talk to me. And hung up on me. Mm -hmm. And it just... Destroyed me, man. It's the same brother who a year ago helped me pack the truck and drive here with all of my from Denver, where I was previously. And I was able to mend that relationship, the relationship with my other brother and with my sister and with people that I destroyed and I hurt and I took from. And I love that you call it redemption because mm. that's what it is. Absolutely. We all deserve it. We're all worthy of it and we we're are. all capable of it. If you're willing, if I'm willing to face those really uncomfortable things that I'd prefer to not, yeah. you know, until pain, pain sets in. That's, I, I'm not the guy that people call for the easier, softer way. I, I don't have the answer to anything. I truly don't. I just have my experience that led to this present. And that's genuinely what the f this is. And I really do my best to treat it as such. Um, and, you know, if there was never repercussions for my actions, if the pain wasn't endured, if someone would have provided me an easier, softer way, I don't think this outcome would have been created. So uh, I'm a fan of, you know, and I got that from my mentor, my main mentor, Lex. You know, when I, I called him, I was stranded at BWI airport. And I said, ah, Lex, I'm stranded. They, they denied me access to a flight. You know, I was, I was insanely intoxicated out of my mind. And, and uh, I sent him a text and I said, Lex, I'm stranded at BWI airport and I want to kill myself. And his response to me was a picture of a poppy plant. <laughs> it wasn't like, oh no, please don't do that. It was like, you bought this. <laughs> and then it was followed by, if you get on a train, come back to Philadelphia. And this is Memorial Day, 2015. He's with his family, he's at a cookout, he's with loved ones. 
that if you get on a train and you come back to Philly, I will pick you up from 30th Street Station. I will let you stay at my house and I will take you to treatment the next morning. You know, he fucking saw in this hopeless, helpless alcoholic what I did not see in myself. You know, and that's the man who, who, who was one of the many men sent to me um, through my divine experiences to let me know that like when I was ready, he would be willing and able to walk with me, right? Not above or below me or direct me in a fucking place or position to walk with me shoulder and shoulder to have an experience with God together. And I could wrap my head around that. You know, I mean, that I could get down with. You're not looking at me from above or below. You're simply saying we're just two fucking bozos on the bus that are about to have an experience mm -hmm. if you're willing to come. And I could do that. Mm -hmm. And I, I can't help but think reflecting you being a mirror for me in this moment, oddly enough, wearing like the same color shirt, right? like <laughs> this moment of I just know. like There's a lot of similarities here. Yeah. And just having this moment of you being a mirror across from me cannot help but think that the universe has interjected my life into my life. Amazing, unbelievable men. Because I did not have them in my boyhood. Right. And here you are with this guy who all you needed this whole time was a man to walk next to you mm -hmm. and to guide you. Yeah. And you got it. No doubt. And I always say, if you plan on embarking in this journey with us and you are going to stay sober, be careful what you fucking ask for. You'll fuck around and get it. <laughs> and I have an abundance of people that hold me accountable and, and my mother who, who, you know, bought me a plot and served me with a restraining order and, and prayed for my death just so she could finally have a peace of mind. She's now become like my best friend, your brother's story. You know what I mean? It's that in abundance. And now it's like, it's, it's a lot that's required there to be a friend to your friends, to be a brother to your brothers. You know, that's, there's a lot and I have to show up for that. And uh, those are the blessings. And that's how you know that you're healing. Yeah. Brother, it's been an amazing, amazing conversation. Has, Thank dude. you for this, genuinely. I'm excited to get into your book, man. Thanks, dude. I appreciate it. This was and, rad. Yeah, it was. Before I ask you my last question, where can everyone find you, learn more about you, and interact with you? If people are out there and they need help with addiction, alcoholism, they can reach me and my partner directly at 610-314-6747, Redemption Addiction Treatment Center. Either myself or John will answer that phone call. Um, if you wanna just go down my web, down my hole, just go to brandonnovak.com. That's everything encompassed in one. It'll take you to, to the pages, to the sites, the platforms. Um, if anyone out there finds it in their heart to donate a penny, a dollar, five dollars to the scholarship fund that I hold to provide beds for any man in need, you could go to Venmo and it's at Novak's house, N-O-V-A-K-S-H-O-U-S-E, all one word. Amazing. And we will put all those links and more in the show notes. And inspired by my friend, Brandon, um, I will any proceeds we make in terms of revenue from this episode will be donated to you. Wow. Just so you know in advance. Thank you. And man. I will be matching it personally. Wow, man. Um, further, just because I always like plugging books because I am an author and I love reading. Please. Yeah. Uh, Brandon's written two amazing books, A Dream Seller, an Addiction Memoir. Yeah. And uh, The Streets of Baltimore, both which are like fucking Jesus Christ, dude. I just did the narration for both too. So I actually read them and that was an interesting exploration I went on. So yeah. if you're into the audio books, they're there as well. I'd love to have you come speak to my clients at the treatment center or the houses. So if you ever find your way towards the Philadelphia, Baltimore, Delaware area. Be an honor. You should absolutely continue this. Be an honor. Philly is one of the most underrated cities in the entire country. I'm a huge fan. <laughs> that said, my friend, my last question yes, for sir. you. What does it mean to you to be unbroken? Uh, 
to me, uh, what do I think of when uh, to be unbroken is that I could never be unbroken if I wasn't broken. Simple. Yeah. Love it. Thank God for the brokenness. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, I agree. I got a tattoo on my knuckles. <laughs> I have yard work on mine. <laughs> Slightly similar, Slightly, but not basically really. Basically the same thing. <laughs> Brother, I appreciate you tremendously. Thank what you. What a great outro. For everything that you do, for everything that you will do. Um, same, man. For your same. honesty, your vulnerability, for your strength, your love, your courage, your this wisdom. This is beautiful. And uh, Unbroken Nation, please check out thinkunbroken.com for this and more. And until next time, my friends, be unbroken. I'll see you. Thank you so much for listening to Think Unbroken. Please share this episode with someone who could use it and help us move forward in our mission of ending generational trauma in our lifetime. And if you would, please take five seconds to pop on iTunes or Spotify, hit that five star, leave a review. And you can also reach out to us on social at Michael Unbroken or at Think Unbroken. And of course, you can check out our YouTube channel at Think Unbroken. Thank you for being a part of Unbroken Nation, my friends. And until next time, be unbroken. We'll be right back to today's show. But before we do, I want to let you know that you can get a free copy of my first book, Think Unbroken, Understanding and Overcoming Childhood Trauma, when you leave a review for the podcast on Apple Podcast, either on desktop or on your phone. All you have to do is go to Apple Podcasts, look up Think Unbroken, click follow in the top right, and then go and leave a review at the bottom. And when you leave that review, screenshot it and send it over to book.thinkunbroken.com where you can upload your contact and mailing information and we will send you a free copy of this award-winning best-selling book, absolutely free, including shipping. Just go to book.thinkunbroken.com to upload your screenshot review from Apple Podcasts for the Think Unbroken podcast. And until next time, my friend, be unbroken. I'll see ya. Hey, my friends, we will be right back to the show. But I have a question for you. Are you struggling with the impact of childhood trauma? Well, know that you're not alone. I'm here to let you know that I'm starting a brand new weekly coaching group that includes a year of live coaching, accountability, support, habit and goal setting, and more. I'm starting a waitlist for the group right now, and I'm only taking a handful of people. And I'll let you know that through this personalized coaching, we'll work together to help you understand how your childhood trauma has shaped your beliefs, behaviors, emotions, and will help you create a roadmap for healing and growth. Right now, you can schedule an absolutely free coaching session with me and get put on the wait list if you go to thinkunbroken.com. My friends, it's your time to turn your trauma into triumph, breakdowns into breakthroughs, and become the hero of your own story. And I'm here to support you in doing that. Just go to thinkunbroken.com to register for a free coaching call with me and to get put on the wait list for the brand new weekly coaching program. We'll be right back to today's show, but before we do, I want to let you know that you can get a free copy of my first book, Think Unbroken, Understanding and Overcoming Childhood Trauma, when you leave a review for the podcast on Apple Podcast, either on desktop or on your phone. All you have to do is go to Apple Podcasts, look up Think Unbroken, click follow in the top right, and then go and leave a review at the bottom. And when you leave that review, screenshot it and send it over to book.thinkunbroken.com where you can upload your contact and mailing information, and we will send you a free copy of this award-winning best-selling book, absolutely free, including shipping. Just go to book.thinkunbroken.com to upload your screenshot review from Apple Podcasts for the Think Unbroken podcast. And until next time, my friend, be unbroken. I'll see ya. Hey, my friends, we will be right back to the show. But I have a question for you. Are you struggling with the impact of childhood trauma? Well, know that you're not alone. I'm here to let you know that I'm starting a brand new weekly coaching group that includes a year of live coaching, accountability, support, habit and goal setting, and more. I'm starting a waitlist for the group right now, and I'm only taking a handful of people. 
And I'll let you know that through this personalized coaching, we'll work together to help you understand how your childhood trauma has shaped your beliefs, behaviors, emotions, and will help you create a roadmap for healing and growth. Right now, you can schedule an absolutely free coaching session with me and get put on the wait list if you go to thinkunbroken.com. My friends, it's your time to turn your trauma into triumph, breakdowns into breakthroughs, and become the hero of your own story. And I'm here to support you in doing that. Just go to thinkunbroken.com to register for a free coaching call with me and to get put on the wait list for the brand new weekly coaching program.